conferenza stampa di Time Out of Mind eh, di Oren Moverman. E il nostro ospite insomma, non ha bisogno di, di presentazioni, siamo qua con appunto, Richard Gear e con la collega Sandra Ebron per questo incontro con, con voi, con la stampa. Lascio la parola a Sandra Ebron per la prima domanda. Thank you Lara. Hello everyone. Um, Richard, I wanted to ask you in your capacity both as producer and actor in the film, I get a sense that this has been a real passion project for you, a labour of love that you've been planning for some time. I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about how you were able to bring it to the screen now. Well, it's a, it's a, my, I have my fellow producers actually over the back, but, and they always laugh because I, I do the long version of this or the short version. So do you prefer the long version or the short version? The long one. The, long one. the little one. Medium. Okay, medium. You get the medium version of this. So there was a script that was sent to me uh, over 10 years ago. And it was, it, it had the seeds of this movie in it. And it wasn't, it, it wasn't a situation that I, uh, that I felt I could make it yet. It still needed a lot of work, but there was something quite extraordinary about it. And in fact, the script had been written in the late 80s which is now 30 years ago, yeah. close to 30 years ago. But surprisingly, the issues that this script dealt with, even many of the, most of the details were exactly the same when I, 10 years ago, as they were 25, 30 years ago. Um, so I ended up, I couldn't get it out of my mind, frankly. I ended up buying the script and had an, a very good idea of what to do with the script. And, um, but I, I was having trouble communicating that. And there was a, a book that came out in New York by a man named Cadillac Man. And it was called uh, The Land of Lost Souls. And it was about his life on the streets of New York. And he had written this in the, with a, a kind of peasant poetry that was deeply real and deeply emotional, uh, but very dry. It was factual. This is what happened. This is how it happened without any editorializing, and it was a very, um, it was exactly what I was trying to communicate when I would, I would, in my own mind, to myself, of how to make this movie time out of mind. So, um, I, uh, quite by accident, ran into Oren Moverman at, uh, at an event, and we had known each other before because he had written several scripts that I had admired, and he had written one of my movies, uh, um, I'm Not There, Todd Haynes' movie and co-written that with Todd. So we were, we were friends already, but I mentioned the script to him, and I said, look, Oren, you, you, you were, you're the guy who should do this rewrite on this, and, but I know you're way too busy and way too expensive, and you couldn't possibly do this, but he said, send me the script anyhow. And I, sent it, I sent it to him, and he responded the same way that I did, and we just pretty much dove in. And that was, and, you know, it wasn't much more than a year ago that we started that process. So this whole thing happened very, very quickly. And I get the sense that it's been a very collaborative relationship between the two of you. It's a real partnership, yeah. I mean, you, you know, if, when you see the film, you'll, you'll realize there's no way that he couldn't have directed it and I couldn't have acted in it unless we were totally on the same page, uh, right from the very beginning. Thank you. <laughs> Prego, no, lascio la parola alla sala perché vedo tantissime mani alzate, quindi Grazie, prego. Sono proprio esatte e messaggero, volevo chiedervi, in questo suo viaggio nell'inferno dei senza tetti di New York, che cosa ha scoperto che non sapeva? Grazie. Uh, momento. You know, I had done a lot of research on this, so I had been around the homeless shelters and uh, been on the streets for, for the 10 years that I was thinking about this film. So I, there wasn't anything that surprised me in terms of that. What was surprising was the experience of being on the streets. And there was a, there was a moment, frankly, we had very little money to shoot this. We had 21 days to shoot the entire film, uh, very short. Um, and we had a concept, and the concept was the, the footprint of the movie would be invisible. I would be out on the streets most of the time, 
and the very long zoom lenses that were capturing uh, the movie. Uh, but no one saw the cameras. They were either under men at work tents, or they were in storefronts across the street, or they were on the roofs of buildings very far away. Um, and we didn't really know if it was going to work, if it was possible that I could be on the streets and not recognized. And the whole illusion of the movie destroyed. So uh, we did a test day, and uh, usually a test day is just to test costumes and makeup and that kind of thing. And in fact, we were testing the whole concept of whether or not this movie was going to work. And uh, the first, this test day was out on Astor Place in uh, Greenwich Village, and it's a very active place. And it's, it's a lot of moviegoers, it's people who were involved in culture. It wasn't going to another planet, it was going right into the center of New York and and potentially our audience for this movie. And um, I frankly didn't know what was going to happen, but I was in character, and I looked in character, and the reality was is that no one paid any attention to me whatsoever. And we were shooting digitally, so we had very long text. We shot first take, I think it was about 45 minutes, in the panhandle on a very busy street corner in New York. No one made eye contact with me. Now for me, it, it, as this five minutes became, 20 minutes became 45, it was a very profound experience for me. One personally, as, as an actor, and someone who is known, but from the other side of, of really feeling what it is to be worse than invisible, invisible it's really like being um, toxic in a way. That um, there's a mysterious kind of anger, I think, starts to come out in people from many blocks away, where there is a, um, a radiation of failure that comes off of how we perceive homeless people. And uh, we don't want to engage in any way whatsoever. But there was a profound experience from that. Which also, you know, it's really funny. There is a you know, the, the tradition that I come from, the Buddhist tradition, the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, there's a tradi tradition of begging, what we would call begging. But it's, it's, it's a peculiar thing because the motivation is radically different than what normally someone thinks or motivates oneself to begging. One, one normally thinks of a beggar as someone who's really looking for money for themselves, or food for themselves, or enough money to buy booze or drugs or whatever it may be, but it's something for themselves. From a monk's point of view, they're offering the possibility for someone to make an offering and create positive merit, which eventually will build up in the mind stream. Now, I must say that there was a certain mixture of those two things in my own experience there, because I wasn't looking for money, personally. I was an actor out there. And I was making, we as filmmakers were making an offering, a possibility right, to everyone who was in range of that camera to create some positive merit. So from my side, it was radically different than what, from what someone who's really on the street looking for money and looking for food. You know? And I won't, I don't, I, there's no way I would experience that because I don't need the money and I don't need food. So the whole experience is going to be radically different. And I'll never probably be able to be in those shoes. You know, I'm very fortunate that way.